It's a pleasure to be with all of you today, uh, and especially virtually with the workshop participants. The purpose of today's presentation is to provide you with a primer on the Animal Welfare Act and the Public Health Service Policy on Humane Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. Today I'm going to focus on the federal statutes and supporting regulations and guidance and provide an overview of what they are, what they focus on, and how they work together. I'm also in the process going to try to avoid making normative statements about their success or lack thereof. The Animal Welfare Act is the primary piece of federal legislation that deals with the protection for warm-blooded animals used in research. Prior to its passage, there were a couple of states that had laws governing the treatment of laboratory animals, but there was very little focus on that aspect of animal protection. It's actually worth remembering that in the mid-1960s, this was also the time that the public interest in the protection of human subjects started to develop. The Animal Welfare Act was passed in 1966 after two articles caused a major public outcry. The first was in Sports Illustrated, and it told the story about a family dog named Pepper who was illegally taken by an animal dealer and euthanized before the family could recover her. The second was an article in Life magazine, pictured here, that focused on the terrible conditions in a dog dealer's farm. The focus on the original legislation was on dogs and cats. Other animals were covered only after an institution registered because of its research involving dogs and cats. Over the next four decades, the legislation was amended a number of times, and this broadened its scope and coverage. The AWA is administered by the United States Department of Agriculture through its division, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, better known as APHIS. The AWA applies to dogs, cats, primates, guinea pigs, hamsters, and farm animals when they are used for laboratory research. One of the most controversial aspects of the AWA is that it specifically excludes birds, mice, and rats. Such rodents are the most commonly used laboratory research subject. The reasoning for this was that an expansion would have stretched USDA's capacity for inspections past the breaking point, thus limiting its ability to regulate larger operations. The full panoply of oversight was also viewed as onerous for small operations. As we'll discuss through other oversight mechanisms, most, probably in the range of about 90% of birds, rats, and mice end up being included in the animal protection requirements. There are nonetheless a few smaller colleges and companies that use only rats and mice and are not subject to the AWA. The AWA itself is fairly spare, but the regulations set out detailed instructions for licensing, registration, record keeping, and local oversight, all under the authority of an attending veterinarian and a local review board. That local review board is called an Institutional Care and Use Committee, or an IACUC. Regulations governing the use of animals in federally funded research first developed about the same time as the AWA. The first guide, which covered the handling of such animals, which we'll discuss in more detail later, was first produced in 1965. The Health Research Extension Act of 1985 provides a statutory mandate for the PHS policies for animals in research. That policy provides standards for research conducted by or using funds that are agencies within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. These include the National Institutes of Health, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Food and Drug Administration, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the Indian Health Service, and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. The Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare oversees the care and use of research in public health service funded research. PHS policy 
requires institutions to establish and maintain proper measures to ensure the appropriate care and use of live vertebrate animals involved in biomedical and behavioral research testing or training activities. PH policy is based on the U.S. government principles for the utilization and care of vertebrate animals used in testing, research, and training. OLAW provides guidance and interpretation of the Public Health Service policy on humane care and use of laboratory animals. It also supports educational programs and monitors compliance with the policy by assured institutions. As noted earlier, the PH policy uses a very broad definition of animal. It applies to all live vertebrate animals, so it includes birds, mice, and rats, as well as fish and other cold-blooded animals. The U.S. government principles for the utilization and care of vertebrate animals used in testing, research, and training were developed by the Interagency Research Animal Committee and were adopted in 1985 by the Office of Science and Technology Policy. As I noted in the last slide, they form the foundation for all PHS rules and regulations that have been developed in more detail since then. In the left-hand column here, I've pulled out the focus of each principle. As you'll notice, for one thing, they begin by incorporating the AWA. One important feature worth highlighting here and this is because there are sometimes questions about whether federal regulations allow or, or perhaps more likely require review boards to consider the overall utility of the research that is being considered. That's the focus here of the second principle, and so it should be viewed as within the purview of a review by an uh, agency or IACUC. As we'll discuss, one important feature of any protocol review, and this is implicit in the AWA as well, is the application of the three R's, which we'll discuss in a little bit. The principles here focus on pain and distress, mandatory sedation, and anesthesia, all of which were neglected in the early days of animal research. These have been a particular focus recently. Here we continue with the remainder of the principles, including appropriate euthanasia. Living conditions and meeting social needs of animals have also been a recent focus. Another focus of review entities is the qualifications of the investigators. Appropriate training is necessary. You can't just perform surgery on an animal without such training. Finally, the last principle does allow for exceptions but it requires a balancing of utilities and review by an IACUC. How well that is done probably depends on the IACUC. ALAC is a nonprofit organization that has evolved in tandem with the federal regulations. It was founded in 1965 to promote uniform standards for animal care in U.S. laboratories. Those standards are now set by the guide. It serves as both an accreditor and an inspector. PHS policy requires that institutions that receive federal funds report when they have such accreditation and also must state problems that they might have incurred during an ALAC review. In this sense, ALAC plays a role similar to that played by the Joint Commission with hospitals. ALAC members are both national and international. All major U.S. pharmaceutical companies and commercial suppliers of animals are accredited by ALAC. So through that connection, it's reasonable to estimate that about 90% of more research or more of research animals in the United States are cared for and used in programs that apply the standards of the guide. Any institution that wishes to conduct research with federal funds is required to file an animal welfare assurance. These are fairly onerous and require a full description of the institution's plan for the care and use of the animals throughout the institution. The assurance must include the composition and qualifications of the institution's IACUC and additional details about the attending veterinarian. 
The institution must certify that it will use the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals as the basis for its policies and procedures. It must also certify that it is either accredited by ALEC or that it has an evaluation procedure in place that assures that it is conforming to PHS policy. Over the last five decades, federal regulation for animal use has evolved considerably from the first focus on dealers and licensing. Good veterinary care remains paramount, but there is also considerable attention given to the appropriate housing and social needs, feeding, humane handling, as well as sound sanitation and ventilation. Both the AWA and PHS policy require that any research institution doing animal research, and that depends on the definition used by that policy, must establish a review board, as we discussed, an Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, fondly known as an IACUC. That committee will review all proposed animal experiments. These are designed to be local committees. The idea is that a committee located within an institution is more likely to have access to what is really taking place in that institution. An IACUC typically has at least five members, one of whom must be a qualified veterinarian. The committee must also include at least one scientist experienced in animal research, a nine scientist, someone whose primary concerns are not scientific, although those individuals may be well acquainted with sciences. IACUCs often include an ethicist or a lawyer. And finally, a member who is not affiliated with the institution. Larger institutions typically have larger IACUCs. All institutions covered by the AWA and PHS policy are responsible for the oversight of all animal-related activities occurring within their institutions, regardless of how long or where the activity occurs. Satellite facilities in areas where any form of surgery is performed on animals must be inspected at least once every six months by the IACUC as part of the semi-annual evaluation. USDA requires semi-annual inspection of all animal study areas, and these are defined as areas where USDA covered animals are housed for more than 12 hours. The guide. So we've talked about the guide previously. It's an internationally accepted primary reference on animal care and use, and its use is required in the United States by the Public Health Service policy. It also serves as the source for the standards used by ALAC accredited entities. It was first published in 1963 under the title Guide for Laboratory Animal Facilities and Care, and it has been revised a number of times. More than a half million copies have been printed since its first publication. Many of us now read it online. In 2006, an ad hoc committee appointed by the Institute for Laboratory and Animal Research recommended that the guide be updated. The latest edition is the product of those recommendations. The guide is currently in its eighth edition, issued in 2011. The guide covers in considerable detail all aspects of the care and use for laboratory animals. These include chapters on establishing an animal care and use program, including the role of the IACUC and protocol review, environment and housing, veterinary care, and specifications for the physical plant overall. Central to the guide is an overarching requirement that care and use of animals must be done adhering to strict ethical standards. Within that construct, it continues to build on the 3R structure that has had a fundamental role in the development of those ethical standards. You'll probably be happy to know I'm not going to read all of these, but I invite you to look at them in detail later. The commitment to the three R's construct is reflected in the more detailed protocol review guidelines that are provided in the guide. 
Given that the three R's form the implicit basis for many of the AWA regulations, an explicit basis for PHS policy, it's worth spending a little time reviewing what they are and how they work. They were first proposed by Russell and Birch in 1959, and they gained broad adherence about a decade later. One of the features of the three R's is that they provide a framework that has been able to evolve as research has evolved. They include reduction in the number of animals used, refinement in the methods used to limit pain and suffering and other aspects of animal care, replacement with insentient material or with animals less likely to experience pain and suffering. Let's look at them in turn. As scientific statistics have evolved, discussion around reduction has also evolved, and there has recently also been considerable discussion about animal models and how to move away from tradi traditional models when appropriate. At the beginning of the AWA, anesthetic use was limited. Now there is regulation and attention through all stages of a surgical procedure. The environment in which an animal lives is given strict consideration. Attention is given to all aspects of handling procedures. One example of this new attention on handling procedures is on how best to handle laboratory mouse, mice rather, something that rarely got attention. Everyone knew how to pick up a mouse. You picked it up by its tail. It turns out that such handling may induce stress and anxiety, and that can have an effect not just on the animal, but on the results of the experiment. New methods have been developed, and this is just one small example of some of the attempts at refinement. One area that is evolving rapidly is replacement. Computer modeling is an ideal that has not yet been achieved. It requires more complete knowledge than we have, but some important strides have been made with so-called organs on chips. These allow the use of fewer animals. As you will recall, one of the main reasons for the passage of the Animal Welfare Act in 1966 was a story that ran in Life magazine about a family pet that was taken and sold for laboratory research. From the beginning, the law provided for the licensing of animal dealers to prevent pet theft and for sale of animals to research facilities. Nonetheless, this issue has continued to have public attention because the law did not prohibit the use of such animals, it just required licensing, and that dealers of such animals meet provenance requirements. The National Academies took on the issue in 2009. As a result, the NIH has phased out funding for research that uses Class B cats and dogs. Such use, however, is still permitted by the Animal Welfare Act for entities that are not using NIH funding so long as they meet regulatory requirements. Finally, in this slide, I'm providing links to the various regulations and guidance that I've referenced today. And that brings us to the end of today's presentation. Thank you for your attention and good luck with the workshop.